p.m. Susan. All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our webinar today with Dr. Alex Jones. Before we get started with her intro and her presentation today, I have a little bit of housekeeping that we need to do. First and foremost is making sure my slides advance, which I'm not seeing. You may have to click the arrow on the bottom of the screen there. Let's try that. How about now? Yep, we can see your next slide. Excellent. OK, uh, and to start off with an indigenous land acknowledgement, and that is that the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center acknowledges the Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, Diné, and Hickorya Apache people on whose traditional homelands Crow Canyon as an organization sits and upon which we all work and reside. We absolutely recognize that our work would not be possible without Indigenous people in the past, present, and future, and that we are grateful to all Indigenous people and support the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands. And I'm going to advance my slide here to talk about our mission. Many of you are longtime friends and supporters of Crow Canyon and know what we're all about. However, if this is your first webinar, we are so grateful you're here with us. Uh, just to let you know, our mission has three parts, and that is to empower past and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archaeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. And if you'd like more information on our center, you can go to www.crowcanyon.org. And our next slide. Um, I'm guessing most of you by now are Zoom experts and you don't need a tutorial on how everything works, but I did want to mention that feel free to go ahead and put any questions you might have for Dr. Jones in the Q&A, uh, and it looks like a little icon, a box with a Q in it at the bottom of your tabs of your screen, and we'll answer as many questions we can following Dr. Jones's presentation today. And then also we have a couple of upcoming webinars to share with you, um, one before the, the Thanksgiving holiday and the second one right after. The first one is Indigenizing Archaeology and Museums with Dr. Woody Aguilar, and that is next Thursday, November 18th at 4 p.m. Mountain Time. And then following the Thanksgiving holiday on December 2nd, which is a Thursday, at 4 p.m. Mountain Time, we have the Ethnoarchaeology of Mongolia's Duca Reindeer Herders with Dr. Todd Surival. So we're looking forward to those. Many of you reach out to us asking how you can make a difference during the pandemic, especially when it comes to tribal communities. And this is a slide showing many different relief funds that you may choose to donate to. This would be a great idea um, Perhaps instead of purchasing a Christmas present this year, you give a donation in somebody's name. If you would like a copy of this information, feel free to reach out to Taylor Hasbrook and she can send you um, the information that's on this slide. And now it's my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dr. Alexandra Jones who is an assistant professor of practice in history and anthropology at Goucher College. At Goucher, she leads the Hollowed Ground Project, which studies and recognizes the role of slavery and racism in the history of the land that Goucher currently occupies. Her work focuses on African diaspora archaeology, community archaeology, and public outreach. Her archaeological career began when she pursued dual degrees in anthropology and history from Howard University. However, it was in pursuit of her PhD from UC Berkeley that Jones was inspired to begin a public archaeology organization. In 2009, she founded a nonprofit called Archaeology in the Community, which provides educational programming to students of all ages. In 2013, Dr. Jones worked for the PBS television series Time Team America as the Archaeology Field School Director, where she trained high school juniors and seniors. And this is where Crow Canyon first met Dr. Jones as well. We were part of that series in 2013 at Crow Canyon. On behalf of the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center staff and our viewers on Zoom and Facebook, we welcome you to the Discover Archaeology webinar series and look forward to learning about how public archaeology can address and redress heritage concerns and needs at the community scale. 
thank you for being with us today, Dr. Jones. Well, thank you for having me. So archaeology education as features, um, I would like to talk about uh, what role archaeology education can play um, in community archaeology um, and in this kind of highlight um, archaeology community or AITC as I call it for short, um, as kind of a case study for some of this work. So archaeology, um, archaeology programs conducted daily by archaeologists make a difference in how citizens perceive their cultural heritage and science. Through educational programs and outreach, archaeologists are inspiring new generations to explore the many fields of archaeological study. Educational programs, which introduce uh, students of all ages to archaeology through an informal education model, tend to capture the attention and the interests of the students. Archaeology can be redressed. It can begin the process set of setting right the wrongs caused by those in the past. It has the ability to do social justice work, particularly with communities that have been the victim to past atrocities. Archaeologists have the ability to raise collective consciousness around inequality and promote the demands and the desires of communities where they work. An archaeology in the community uses archaeology education as a tool of redress. It conducts programs in, com in communities seeking to address local needs, heritage concerns identified by the local communities. So what I want to start with is just thinking about what do we mean when we say archaeology education. Oftentimes, the first thing that pops up is uh, just teaching youth. Um, and I want to kind of push us beyond this traditional paradigm of thinking about schools and think about we teach all students. And when I use the term students of all ages, um, all of us as individuals never stop learning um, and never stop experiencing all that the world has to offer. But archaeology education is also something that's done through multiple mediums. Then the concept of redress. So the definition is to remedy or set right. So archaeology has the potential when conducted collaboratively with communities to become a powerful education tool, but a tool which can be used to include everyone in our shared past. And what I mean about this is when we think about the history that we've traditionally been told, there's a number of groups have been omitted, specifically from American history. Their stories have only been marginally touched upon, if mentioned at all. And one of the wonders of archaeology is it allows us to bring everyone back into the story of our shared history and past as Americans. So archaeology in the community. Archaeology in the community's mission is to promote and facilitate the study of pub the public understanding of archaeological heritage. And this is done through informal education programs, which provides hands-on hands learning, professional development, and community events. Our objectives are to increase community awareness of the benefits of archaeology and history through these public events, to provide archaeological enrichment programs to students of all ages, to provide professional development to college students interested in pursuing careers in archaeology education and community archaeology, and to partner with educational institutions, cultural establishments, cultural organizations to develop, promote, and implement archaeological programs. So just a few things about AITC. The organization has been around for 13 years, which will be 14 in March of uh, next year. Even though it's a mid-Atlantic based company, which means we primarily uh, focus on Maryland, Virginia and Washington, DC, the program has operated in two other countries. So we've worked in Belize um, with the Institute of Archaeology there, implementing programs and heritage programs, as well as in Haiti um, to work alongside the um, Milo um, archaeological project, looking at San Souci and educating uh, the community on archaeology along with that project. 
In addition to that, we have an ongoing project in um, St. Croix within the US Virgin Islands. So youth programs, uh, this is the hub of what we do. Uh, when we were initially founded, um, one of our focuses was on uh, teaching youth and how this work can be done. So out of school education programs, also known, um, known as informal learning environments, have a great potential for improving science learning and broadening youth participation in science. Students that participate in quality enrich um, informal learning programs perform better academically because they have gained added help and exposure in ways that would not, they would not in school. Informal science education can take place in museums, science centers, botanical gardens, after school programs, science camps, um, and through various forms of media. There are a number of informal um, school programs that take place on school um, grounds and typically run by community-based or nonprofit organizations. The National Research uh, Council said, there's mounting evidence that structured non-school science programs can feed or stimulate science-specific interests of adults and children, and with positive influence, increase the academic achievements and may even expand the participant's sense of a future in a career in these options. So archeology, span like many sciences, allows participants to engage in hands-on activities, allowing participants to feel that they are part of the scientific process while getting an introduction to the field. Archaeology is also interdisciplinary, meaning it utilizes the skills of many different uh, branches of science in order to gain knowledge about a culture. During an archaeological project, participants can um, be exposed to botany, osteology, zoology, and other fields that will provide additional information about material culture being uncovered at the particular site. AITC was founded um, to right a wrong, and it was a wrong that I saw in my community. The education system, as it was at the time in Washington, D.C., was failing our city's residents. Generations of Washingtonians were being educated in a broken system because of de facto se segregation. Um, nothing was actually changing. From a young age, I recognized the correlation between ethnicity, economics, and education in Washington, D.C., and though at the time, I didn't know the terms for the multiple intersecting forms of systematic dis um, discrimination, it was plain what was taking place. With AITC being in operation for just over 13 years, at the core of its organization is accessible access to knowledge. Our mission to promote and facilitate the study and public understanding of archeological heritage is at the center of everything we do. I know firsthand how inaccessible, foreign, and yet transformative archeology span can be. In my community, there were no archeological programs and the subject was never mentioned in school. I felt it was my mission to change this situation and make sure that children in my local community would have the opportunity to learn about archeology span from someone who looked like them. Certainly it is true that education is a form of power and in order to access quality education, it requires capital. Looking back at my childhood and the childhood of youth I serve, I see tangible manifestations of this, tan um, of this statement. AITC's goal is to make science and archaeology education accessible to all, no matter your class, ethnicity, religion, or gender. In order to ensure we truly are for all people, 100% of our youth programs are free to the public we serve. The programs are advertised on radio, social media, newspapers, blogs, community boards, on local TV shows, ensuring a maximum exposure to all members of the public. It is this kind of accessibility that demonstrates the utility and the purpose of archaeology. So one of the programs uh, that we run is our archaeology club. And with most things, um, we went completely virtual last year. We were about to start our program up. We had 50 students registered for the in-person. We met one day 
And then effectively all of the US shut down the very next week um, due to COVID. One of the things we realized, and I got emails from parents uh, very upset, very worried. Um, the first thing they said was that schools weren't prepared for this. Uh, they didn't know what they were gonna do with their students. Um, they were wondering if we were gonna start the club back up. Did we have any idea? My staff and I got together and literally realized that our community was crying and had a serious need at that point. We came together and within 24 hours completely created the club um, into a virtual format. We spent hours, <laughs> literally 12 hours straight, packing boxes, um, post office, mailing off and everything. In addition to this, we thought about all of the other needs that we could meet um, through this process. One was with um, part of our school, uh, students went to schools that were virtual. The other part had schools which they completely shut down. So we added worksheets such as this coloring page. We added in lesson plans that parents could do with their students. We gave extra supplies for these additional um, lesson plans. We thought about all of the different things we needed to do and all of this was free. Just like our parents didn't have for um, to purchase or to pay for anything with the in-person, we also made this. We completely switched to a Zoom format. And within two weeks, we were back meeting again, our virtual archaeology club. So when we think about accessibility, um, one of our big things is trying to make sure that um, money and finances aren't a barrier recognizing the greater needs of our community and how archaeology can fill this void. And it doesn't always um, manifest into something as simple as, well, we're being teachers, but we're helping parents out in a time when they don't know what to do with their um, students. We sent our students the snacks the same way we always did, because we realized some of our students receive school lunches. So um, by giving them their snacks and ensuring that they still had access to uh, this food, just as they would if they were coming into us anyway, all of this was thought out and placed. As we've moved forward, what we realized is there's still a great need. Um, some people are very much uncomfortable. Some people are remote. We've also realized that people have moved further away. So what we have decided to do moving forward in order to fully support our community is that our archeology span club will be run in a hybrid version from here on out in order that we still may be able to serve all those. And then we also realized we gained a following, um, even had students internationally. We had a set of students from Jamaica who ended up signing up once we ran the virtual club the second time. So we even mailed the supplies um, out of country as well. So this is one way of uh, setting things right and fixing wrongs um, that we saw within our community was trying to make sure that quality education um, is accessible. Another thing that we did was thinking about parents, thinking about the content of our education, how we train our students, when we were in person and we had field trips, um, we pushed our parents to come. And this is one of those things that most people are like, we try to keep all the parents away when it comes to student, you know, um, but we actually encourage them because we feel like education is a family thing. So the parents get to come on field trips behind the scenes to archeological sites, to museums, to labs, um, and also learn in tandem with the students because we feel like it's our job to make sure that our whole community is being educated, not just our students as well. Another project uh, that we work on, and as I kind of talk about these things, what I want you to kind of keep in the back of your mind is this concept of redress, writing things that are wrong, um, fixing uh, histories and stories, or fixing um, Archaeology is this vehicle. So the Estate Little Princess Project. Uh, the Estate Little Princess Project is a Smithsonian slave Rex project that's funded by them. Uh, it's run by the Society of Black Archaeologists. There are five co-PIs for the site. And AITC comes in and um, works in partnership to run um, the high school portion 
of this project. One of the awesome things about this project is this project was created in complete partnership with the community. So we have a number of local Crucian uh, archaeology community, community, excuse me, groups that we partner with um, and that we um, confer with as we developed our research design, as we developed um, our, our vision for this site. And one of the things that uh, the initial uh, creators of the project recognized was, was, was the community wanted a youth component. They wanted children on island to be trained in archaeology because this wasn't something that had been happening. Even with all of the field schools that were coming down from other universities, no one was actually training and working with youth on island. So to meet this need, we did just that. So we created a program where 15 youth from the Caribbean Boys and Girls Center um, would come in and for one week work directly with me. I would train them on archaeology education. Um, they would go out, they would excavate, they would learn um, the full process. We had a career exploration uh, workshop where we would talk about the different careers, past in archaeology, how we got there, what we do with it, um, what are all the cool things that we're interested in and how um, can they do this as well. What came out of this project, and when you have a project that truly is community-based, is that at the end of the first season, we were having a conversation um, with a community member. And they literally looked at me and said, this is great, but then what? There are no jobs on island for the students uh, to participate in this. There's nothing for them to continue and do after they participated in this project. So then what? And this is where the social and economic uh, and, and the community empowerment question came because out of this, this question slash challenge came, how do we take archeology span and we do something bigger with it? So I created internships and it's internships for students who are returning from that first summer could work with me. They would get paid for the week. Um, so I gave them a stipend. In addition to that, uh, the Boys and Girls Center um, said they need certificates for finishing the field school. Um, much like they would get, you know, with any other uh, program, they need a certificate. So created a certificate for it, uh, created the internship. There was an ask for it to be a little bit longer. So I would bring the interns in a half a week uh, earlier and train them. Each year I changed the curriculum. So each summer they would learn a new set of skills so that my interns coming in would actually be trained a week earlier on a whole new skill set that they hadn't got the summer before in order to help teach and move forward. So I was constantly building. The other thing is thinking about these are middle school and high school students. They want to go to college. How do I help prepare them for college? So in addition to that, we paid for their membership into the St. Croix Archaeological Society, talking with them, getting them to think about extracurricular activities. What does it look like to write um, your statement for your schools? What sorts of things are you interested in? Are you interested in pursuing archaeology? You have all these archaeologists down here who work at these universities. Um, you can apply at universities where we're teaching. So thinking about how we take this a little bit further than just I'm coming down for a week. The community asked for me to work with students and that's it, but making this a lifelong thing. So this summer, I'll be going back down in 2022 and this will be the fifth year of running this project. And out of this, I have two students um, who will officially be going off to college uh, next year, who will have gone through the program and have been internship interns for a number of years. So just thinking about how something as small as your regular research project can also do redress, can also fill a niche and fill a need within a community economic wise, but also empowerment wise, where you're training up a new core group of scientists who potentially can come back in, in five, six, seven years, then be the archeologists who work on the island. Representation matters. In the field of archeology, span less than 15% of the Society of American Archeology span is made up of people of color. And out of that 3% are African-American. And this is 
according to stats taken in 2015. The students AITC works, works with may only meet one African-American female archeologist in their lifetime, let alone one who was born and raised in Washington, DC, just like them. Researchers have suggested that students in urban environments need broader exposure to science mentors and role models who have backgrounds similar to theirs. Scientists need to create more female-friendly science programs who have um, backgrounds similar to theirs. Excuse me. Um, and instruct, excuse me, and ground science instruction in students' cultural knowledge and experience as well. Understanding the importance of representation, I made it a point to start off as many programs as possible saying something about myself and my background. AITC's volunteer staff is diverse. And the idea is to show students that scientists, especially archaeologists, can be and are just as diverse as the world that we live in. So when we talk about presentation matters, uh, one of the reasons why I put up this image um, of a film being taken is we have a project right now where we partnered with ASOR and we're creating new archaeology curriculum content and about Egypt and Nubia. And one of the complaints that we heard was every, every school has a section when they talk about world history that focuses on Egyptology, but it's very limited. Oftentimes it's only um, maybe a, a few pages within a book or it's that block in the textbook like for extra knowledge, let's read about uh, Egypt. And so what we decided to do was create a video where the teachers don't even have to learn new uh, content. They can actually put it in. And these are Egyptologists and Nubiologists who are actually giving the content to the students and teaching them about, the, um, about Egypt and about Nubia. And in addition to that, we've created lesson plans with activity sheets. So the teachers don't even have to do anything more than hand out the worksheets and read the directions to them. So thinking about how can we do this work of adding um, content or creating content in areas that are much needed, but also that makes it easier on our educators? But going one step further than that, thinking about the content and the educators themselves. So AITC makes it um, our highest priority that when we run archaeology clubs or camps, we diversify the topics. So um, each kind of club is run with a different theme. And not only do we diversify the topics, we diversify the scholars who come in and talk. Uh, so I did have an Egyptologist from Egypt actually come in as a guest speaker to teach the one day at the club on Egypt. I wanted them to hear firsthand what it was like growing up in Egypt, to hear uh, the uh, organic, cultural knowledge coming from somebody who lived in that um, particular region. And then to hear their history and their knowledge from them as a scholar as well. So thinking about what we expose them to and exposing them to things that they otherwise wouldn't be. This again goes into taking them uh, to diverse places, but also letting them see polyvocal uh, educators. So if we're going to talk about Indigenous studies, I want an Indigenous scholar there who can speak to their life ways, the way uh, that they uh, were raised, and then also speak from their cultural perspective while training our students in their history. So thinking about how that also plays in so that we create uh, this diversity and not just kind of a, a monotone of what we're used to, which is uh, grabbing a textbook and um, using lesson plans that have already been created, but allowing people to tell their own stories and their own histories in their own voices and letting students see that. The other thing is that students need to see people that look like them. When you have the same educator all the time, it may not resonate, it may look different, Students wanna be able to see somebody and that person reinforce that you too can be like me one day. So by thinking about who these educators are and reaching out, you're able to then make every student um, feel seen and feel heard. 
that's also a, just as an aside note, um, one of the beautiful things now um, about Zoom is that you can Zoom in an educator from anywhere in the world. And we have been taking full advantage um, of that. I had archeologists from Belize talk to our students and actually show them artifacts that are never seen by the public, but show it to my students directly uh, these are Zoom. So just kind of thinking about that as well. divert just a little bit into this idea of social justice. So archaeology and how archaeology um, can also be an arm of social justice and redress. And in this, I, I'd like to highlight a few um, archaeology sites that not that AITC doesn't directly work on, but just to kind of give you an idea of something to think about. So the Tulsa massacre and looking at what took place at Greenwood. One of the things that um, archaeology has allowed now is there's always been two competing stories that what happened wasn't that bad. And what we have uncovered in this past year based on um, GPR and excavations is, oh, it was that bad and more. Um, and so archaeology has been able to do that uh, step of redress and uh, giving voice to those who have said for years, this is what has happened. Uh, the Crosby Side Hotel did work on gender studies. So looking at women and um, women's spaces and how they utilize that and putting that voice back into understanding how women vacationed solo. Africatown and underwater archeology. span Africatown uh, just uh, had National Geographic come out and with search, they found the Clotilda which has now uh, vindicated the story that the descendants of Africatown have told for years, which was the ship did exist. Um, and in fact, this was how their ancestors came to be in Mobile, Alabama. And archeology span has now done that of um, making right that story and making it true. And then you also have the Undocumented Migration Project Lab which is looking at the lived stories of migrants and those who are crossing over the US-Mexico border. And I bring these up because when we think about content and we think about stories and we think about um, representation matters, these are multiple stories in which we can utilize in classrooms and we can utilize in public education spaces to teach those in our community about other people and what's going on, but also allows the diverse community that we have to see themselves in the research that's being done. Uh, via archaeology. So AITC uh, works with an organization um, called the Friends of Moses Hall. And currently uh, in the US, something that is coming up more and more is African American cemeteries and um, the destruction um, of African American cemeteries. And one of these cemeteries is the Morning Star Tabernacle number 88 um, Order of Moses Cemetery located in Cabin John, Maryland. It's an African-American benevolent society cemetery that was recently in this year listed as one of America's 11 most endangered historic sites by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. One of the ways AITC partners um, with this cemetery in order to get their story out is we use this cemetery as our field trip site. So one of our topics was to talk about how archeologists document uh, cemeteries and how we do this work. So all of our students and their parents came out to the cemetery. We did a complete historical tour of the cemetery. We talked about how the cemetery um, was encroached upon by the state of Maryland's highway system in the 60s. We talked about what the ongoing battle currently, um, this site was in danger of um, being disrupted by the expansion of the 495 highway. So they were going to cut into more of the cemetery. So we discussed that with our students and their parents in order to let them understand and kind of educate them about what's taking place with cemetery sites. And then the students did the work of actually um, documenting the headstones within the cemetery along with their parents. So it became a great joint project in which we were able to do advocacy 
for the actual cemetery through the lens of education while also supporting their goal and giving back to them. Another way that we have kind of continued in this partnership is this idea of training to be of service. AITC, because we are a nonprofit, because we have a number of volunteers, a number of people who are interested um, in the advocacy work that we do in archaeology, we partnered with the Historic Preservation Program of Montgomery County. Um, and what we did was we came up with a photogrammetry class. Basically, the county was saying we just don't have enough people to go out and photograph and take images of all of these cemeteries that we're uncovering in our county. Um, I'm one person, I need more help. So we came up with a training program in which we spent three days training regular volunteers, just people in the community who wanted to come out, who wanted to learn the basis of photogrammetry, but who also wanted to help as it related to cemeteries. So the initial um, was a, a online program where Brian Crane, who is the um, head of historic preservation um, for Montgomery County, he sat and he trained um, all the volunteers via Zoom how to take the photographs, how to do the work. I again brought the volunteers out to the Morning Star Cemetery. One, it's a perfect training ground because they would be photographing heads down to cemeteries anyway. But two, it allowed me the ability to be an advocate for this cemetery and tell the history of this cemetery to more people um, within the um, Maryland community so they would understand what was taking place and the importance of this sacred space. And they took the photographs. After that, they came back and he did a training with teaching them how to import the photographs into the software and then send the data to him. So one of the cool things that came out of this is that all of the headstones in this cemetery then um, were put into um, the software and we have 3D models of all the headstones in the cemetery. So it was a, a way to help our community. It was a way of helping the cemetery, um, which at the time, or still doesn't have funds to kind of do this work, to have all of this uh, documentation done around it and about it, but while also doing advocacy. So I kind of just want to end here and kind of open up and talk a little bit, but Archaeology can be used as the change that we want to see in the world. And the one thing that I want to um, leave you with is that um, what I really love um, about working with AITC is uh, the sky's the limit. Um, we see things that are wrong and literally our immediate question is, how can archaeology come in and help solve this problem? Um, what and how can we use um, our skill sets as archaeologists to assist people to help, and in what capacity um, can we do this work? And so I challenge all of us um, as archaeology enthusiasts, as advocates for, and as archaeologists um, to also ask that same question of ourselves and figure out how um, we can use archaeology as we dress and change the things that we see wrong and, and change the stories and the histories moving forward so that we're all reflected and we see ourselves in all aspects of our shared past. Thank you so much, Alex. That was fascinating. We appreciate your, your discussion on all of those topics. One thing that came to mind for me is thinking about collaborative archaeology and thinking about community archaeology and how we really want to partner with people as opposed to just study people. And so I'm really fascinated and curious what kinds of research design questions have community members been interested in that maybe surprised you or perhaps a traditional archaeologist wouldn't even think about? Um, everything from uh, just um, how can this, the, political questions of how do we solve or how do we write this story? Um, 
for example, um, looking at the Morning Star uh, Cemetery, um, getting advice on how archaeology is done and being consulted at they're going through the 106 process. Um, what is right? What is not right? You know, things that as an organization we wouldn't necessarily expect to hear, but community members saying, hey, can you help us? Um, is this going right? Are we doing these things? Can you also help us advocate um, using archaeology? Um, th those sort of things you don't always expect to hear. Um, and again, we focus more on the education side. We do um, we don't do hardcore research except for looking at how education is advancing community overall. Um, so as an independent archaeologist, there's a slew of things that come up <laughs> that, um, uh, such as um, pay, you know, creating micro economies, um, questions around uh, proving a, a rumor or a thing that someone else has said wrong, and having somebody directly say, "I want you to help me refute this person over there." So even kind of those intra-community. Um, misunderstandings and wrongs um, also come up as well. So it seems like this type of work is opening up the narrative in new ways. And maybe the narrative of the past was a dominant colonial aspect or perspective on the past. And now what your work is allowing it to do is to take a look at um, different approaches to viewing the past. And could you speak a little bit more about how that type of work is, is changing the discipline of archaeology and our interpretations and possibly even our history books. Yeah, so um, the idea of decolonizing um, our, our past is, has become very big. But one of the things that I say happens in that is that we also need to recognize that different people had different viewpoints. Um, and you also have to give space for all of those viewpoints and understanding um, of what took place and what happened. And it doesn't always mean that someone's interpretation or telling of a historical thing may be wrong. It may be from their cultural or their particular lens. But in that, you also have to give space for another group and another person who've experienced it and their cultural understanding and lens as well. And also, kind of all of the in-between. So making sure that, uh, I think the best way to do it is that, or explain it is a holistic perspective of what's taking place historically and also recognizing there are always power dynamics at play and recognizing those and um, inequalities and inequities and how all of that plays into how this story has traditionally been told. But when we retell it, making sure that we're also talking about all of those different things that were at play and giving um, a complete narrative and telling of the, um, the story and the situation. Okay, I'm gonna go to the questions um, that are coming in. And there's one from Nancy that's asking, what is the story behind AITC, um, your organization with Belize and Haiti and how did those partnerships come about? Okay. Um, so essentially just doing this work uh, for years, a lot of people um, have known about the programs um, that we've done. So I got contacted interestingly enough by the State Department for Belize. And uh, the US was going into re-signing the MOU with the Belize government. And they wanted a community archeologist to come in and talk about um, heritage preservation and how this work could be done. And they also wanted to do a program because um, embassies traditionally do programs in the countries that they're uh, residing in. So they wanted a youth program along with this. Um, and since I did youth programs and I also do heritage preservation programs, that's kind of how I got started. And for three years, I partnered um, with Niche where we would go to all 12 of the districts, do a youth program. But in addition to that, I would talk to the customs. I would talk to uh, the heads of the police force, um, as well as business owners to explain that we're educating the youth within the country to handle looting a certain way and to revere. So as we're passing this message along, they're about to become the front line uh, for preservation and anti-looting 
as police, as customs, you need to listen to the youth. You need to also, you know, heed with their warnings, but also talking to uh, customs about how you're handling tourists because it wasn't the people who were always uh, causing these problems but the tourists that were doing that. Um, with Haiti, it was a project that um, one of my colleagues was conducting and he wanted a youth component and a community archeology span uh, component. And he asked, um, basically just saying that AITC does this work, would we be willing to partner with him on his project? Because um, his community leader that he was working with, um, which happened to be the head of the local community center in Milo, wanted a program for the children, wanted something to be done with them um, in order to make this connection between archeology. span But there was also, a slight misunderstanding in what archeologists do in that area. So it was an opportunity to train not only on what archeology span is, but what we don't do, such as we aren't the ones looting sites, we don't steal anything, we don't take anything. These are laws and um, explaining that to the children because most people don't realize that one thing children do is run home and tell their parents everything they learned that day. Um, so it was kind of an awesome way of also disseminating information. So when they did have that community meeting um, at the end of the week, the children had effectively, and I taught all of the kids in all of Milo. So it was well over 70 some odd students um, in that town that I taught so effectively, they knew everything because the students had told them. All right, another question came in from Dr. Elaine Franklin, who is one of Crow Canyon's former director of education. Um, and her question is, how do you fund your youth programs? Do you have endowments? Do you have donations? Um, how is it supported? So we are fairly small, um, considering all of the work that we do. Uh, traditionally, um, to this point, it's been private donors. Um, we've, we, which is kind of unheard of to operate this many years. Um, we started receiving grants um, and writing for grants about three years ago. But prior to that, it was all private donors and then um, entities like the State Department. Um, of course, they're paying for programs. So when anything was that large, the entity that was requesting us would actually pay uh, for the, the program. Our partnership with the Slave Rex Project in the Smithsonian, the Smithsonian also funds um, that, and we do it kind of as a subcontractor for them. But our everyday programs, such as the youth programs, are all from private donors. Do you spend a lot of time grant writing to support programming? Yes. <laughs> yes. All right, there's a question from Heather. Do you think that Zoom will continue to be a more eco-friendly and economically accessible alternative to travel-based education? Yes and no. Um, I, I think it does make it accessible. It does make it a little bit easier. You still have to think about the digital divide, um, how many children don't have access to internet, their own computers. Um, so it doesn't negate traveling and being in person. Um, we have always thought and built into our programs, even things like travel. So when we're in person, we always make sure that within DC, um, we're heavily metro accessible. We always make sure that our club is next to a metro station. Um, we even offer to parents who may have issues uh, with paying for students to get back and forth um, smart trip cards so that they can even travel to camp back and forth for free. Um, so as much as I think it is um, and will be great moving forward as an option, I, I don't think it completely wipes out uh, the in-person portion because we do have a number of students that don't have still access and it, nothing beats actually going to them, which is the difference. A lot of our programs, except for our archeology span club, um, we as the educators go to them and into their communities. So we aren't actually built, um, set up in a building versus we create school wherever we go. When Crow Canyon was transitioning from in-person programming to online programming when the pandemic started, we really got into this question of how do we develop experiential programming that's online? So can you speak a little to maybe some interesting twists and turns that you came up with to allow for that experiential education to still take place? Yeah, so for us, um, it requires mailing everything to our students ahead of time. <laughs> So we're very big in, if we were in person, you would have these supplies. So just because we're in that you don't have the supplies. Um, so we create um, lessons 
um, that we one have the, um, of course you have the PowerPoint kind of going, but the students also have the objects. So as we're teaching with them, we're asking them to look at the objects, we're sending the rulers to them, the pencils to them, the paper, we're all measuring it together, we're asking what they see, so we go through that same process. Um, another really cool thing is last summer, um, we did summer camp online as well. And we partnered with Harvard who had made their museum, their Near Eastern Museum completely virtual. They had cubes, 3D cubes where uh, you just print it out and you form this cube. And if you stuck your phone to it, you could actually see the artifact in your hand moving 3D. So also doing partnerships with that. So we sent the pre-printed out sheets to the students with scissors and said, cut this out, make this box. And then, you know, while we're teaching and you're going through the tour of the museum, you can also use a phone to look at the artifacts. So you get that um, experiential and kind of the tactile aspect as well. That's mm, really cool. Um, so this question from Heather is sort of in tandem with that discussion, which is what is photogrammetry? So photogrammetry is taking multiple photos of an object and creating a 3D image of it. And then how would you maybe apply it to your programming with kids? Um, so for us, it was, it was just the cool idea of being able to look at artifacts in 3D versions. Um, so you can actually, even though we can't be there at the museum, we can spin the artifacts so they can see all of the different angles and be able to look at it as if they were there in person. All right, we have a question from Tom, who's wondering about metrics and outcomes. Uh, and wants to know if you have any plans to measure those outcomes for the long distance, meaning um, do students or interns continue their interest or studies in archaeology beyond the programming and the internships that you provide? So yes, that has become uh, my uh, research, like my, I guess my, um, Oh, I don't know, my, my passion research project, because of course, when you teach students, you have to wait for them to grow up. Um, so St. Croix, because it is an island, has been the place where I've been kind of doing that work and monitoring them over the years. Um, in addition to um, actually giving post and pre-survey, so each summer we give a post and um, a pre, excuse me, and a post survey at the end of each program. And we ask them what they like, what they didn't like, what would you like us to change? What did you learn? All of those. We've created videos. Um, and so one of the cool things is based on the knowledge that our students has gained, um, we have an app for students. And the what is archeology span video is actually based on the students in St. Croix defining what is archeology. span So it's them effectively telling other students what archeology span is and how it's defined. Um, so we do a lot of metrics that way, but, um, Again, the, the biggest problem with uh, youth is that you gotta, you gotta kind of watch them. So it's years and years of work um, to see what kind of comes out of it. But that is something I've done. Um, I've also looked at and actually have a publication on um, the students that I worked with um, at a DCPS school and talking about um, the increase and kind of the change and working with looking at science stats within the city. Um, versus how the students are doing and kind of moving. And a lot of our club members, one of the reasons why every time we meet, we change the curriculum each time is because we have a lot of the same students who come back year after year after year to be in the club. And we want to make sure they're gaining new knowledge about archaeology and ex being exposed to new scholars each time they came back. And it's a six week program that we do twice a year. Next question comes from Molly, wondering what advice would you give to someone who wants to pursue community archaeology? And I'm going to add on to that as well. Are there any particular programs across the nation right now that you might recommend that are stronger than others? Yeah, um, ooh, that's loaded. Uh, so aside from AITC, I do do research and I am a community based um, archaeologist. Um, patients is the first thing I would give you. Um, being genuine, being honest, um, uh, being a good listener. Uh, this work means basing yourself in a community. Um, and I'm also very big on, um, you're doing community archeology, span 
which means that as much as you're getting something out of it as a scholar, which means your publications, your book, your tenure, uh, those sort of things, you need to also be giving back to that very same community that gave you so much. Um, so keeping that at the forefront of your work that you do is that if you truly are a community archaeologist, this community in which you're working in becomes your community, and you need to make sure that they understand that, but that you operate in that paradigm um, as you are a researcher. There are a number of good scholars um, who are doing work. Uh, so Justin Donovan, Ayana Fluellen, uh, William White, um, I'm trying to think, uh, uh, Nidra Lee is doing stuff. Um, I'm trying to think who else, me. If you, um, so we're kind of spread out, but there are a number of scholars who are doing um, some really fabulous uh, community archeology span work. Um, and I often say like, there's a cute cheat. So the International Journal for Community Archeology, span you literally can go through that journal and find a number of people within the US who are doing phenomenal work and um, who are continuing to do that work as well as internationally. Um, and you can look to see what universities they're based out of um, and then be able to move forward with those projects. All right, our next question comes from Becca Simon, who um, was a former archeologist here at Crow Canyon. She's also the assistant state archeologist for Colorado. And Becca writes that she's actually a graduate of DCPS programming and wants to know what kind of reception do your programs uh, re have or get by the DC school system as a whole? So um, as any quality educator knows, uh, you don't actually work with the school system, you work with the teachers. Um, so what I would say is I am a uh, bottom up, uh, organizer grassroots where I literally go to teachers and we offer the programs directly to teachers. So most of our partnerships are with the actual teachers, not the schools, because teachers have a lot more pool. The school system has a lot more bureaucracy. Um, and so in working from the bottom down method, we've had a great reception, um, especially from teachers who are um, super committed to bringing in extra things. Because I am a former DCPS teacher, um, I know how hard it is for teachers. So all of the program that I've created is teacher friendly, meaning that I'm constantly thinking of ways to not force the teacher to have to learn new things, but how can I take this load off you and use my expertise to save you and maybe even give you a free class period. Um, so right now, AICC has a partnership with Mount Pillar, and every summer we bring uh, 15 teachers to Mount Pillar for a week. And we train them in how to teach archaeology in the classroom, but they also get to excavate. And we've had that program funded um, completely, um, thank God, by uh, Independent Foundation for the past few years. And so all of the teachers have been able to come for free. That's 40 hours of uh, continuing education credits, uh, a whole week of them staying somewhere really cool, getting to excavate, which actually is great for them, but also learning these different lesson plans um, of how they can incorporate and I work with them directly. So not to create a whole archaeology lesson, but how to slip archaeology into the lessons that they're already teaching and how to do this in like a cool way and how to partner with other teachers so that they can use sites and do this um, cross disciplinary teaching as well. And so we spend one whole week doing that. And that's very well received, especially since um, we've been able to make it completely free for educators. That's great. All right, the next question is from Ella, and Ella wants to know, how have these programs for young students influenced you and your work? So I'm a teacher at heart. Um, and so for me, it's, it's the joy that I see on the face. Um, it's the hugs I get. Um, I think like any teacher, you love a hug. Um, that's why COVID is so frustrating. <laughs> um, but I, I, it's hearing that they're interested in archaeology, hearing their response. Um, I think the one thing that has touched me the most and made me realize this was my calling um, was a few years back, I was featured at Archaeocon. And um, I'll never forget, someone came up to me and said, one of your students is out in the hallway. And there was another speaker before me and they were like, and my student was 11, mind you, but they were like, I don't wanna listen to this person. 
I want to see my teacher. She's so cool. She's way better than this person. Um, and needless to say, the person at the time was a TV personality. So of course, I thought this person was way more important than me. Um, but having that come from the mouth of babes and recognizing that you're making a huge impact and this is what they think of you and what I say and how I say it is what they grow up and how they look at the world and how they look at other cultures and how um, they grow up to be stewards of our heritage and our culture moving on um, really lets me know uh, that I'm doing something right. Um, and so I, I think that's it. It gives me the motivation to keep going because this is not easy work. Um, and I think all of us as educators or people who have ever made archeology span your path knows that this is very grueling, hard, taxing work. Um, but that's kind of what keeps me going is my students. All right, well, we're getting close to the end, but I have one more question, which I get asked as an archaeologist all the time, which is, how did you decide you were going to become an archaeologist? Were you a kid? Were you an adult? What was the inspiration for you going into this profession? So going back to how I was raised, I never knew about archaeology, um, which is one of my biggest issues with growing up in D.C. I'm in the shadow of the Smithsonian um, and never heard of archaeology until I got to college, um, not in school, not anything. And so um, once I got to college, I took an archaeology course. My professor said that he takes students to um, Chimchicmil, Mexico. And I was like, oh, I want to go to Mexico. Um, I went. I absolutely fell in love with archaeology. It was something about sitting in the pit in the hot sun with my water boiling with an upset stomach and <laughs> with ringworm. Um, and talking with the guys while like digging up rocks and joking and them teaching me about how to be a proper woman and all of this greatness um, that I was like, this is exactly what I want to do for a living. Um, and so I fell in love and I have never looked back. All right. Well, congratulations on a very successful career so far to this point. And you have many, many years ahead of you. We're excited to see what kind of work you're also going to do in the future. Thank you so much for working with our youth in the nation and for making a difference in the world. It's really appreciated. Um, from one archaeology center to you and your center, um, we know that public education is the way to go to make sure that we can make a better world. So we want to thank you so much for your time, Alex, and we hope um, you stay safe and healthy out there. And thanks to all of our viewers as well. Everybody take care. Thanks.